The Second World War, 1939 to 1945, a tragic break. This will be the shortest chapter in our lecture series. In some countries, the war effort did not thwart film production. For instance, the film industry in the United Kingdom thrived during the war. Developing into a strong national film industry, practically ruled by the rank organization. In Poland, that was impossible. Normal film production was out of the question. A series of tragic deaths began already in September 1939. On September the 17th, the day the Red Army marched into Poland, Tadeusz Dołęga Mostowicz, the leading screenwriter of the late interwar period, tried to intervene on some minor issue with a Red Army officer who simply shot him on the spot. And so it went. Eugeniusz Bodo died in a Soviet gulag camp. He had assumed his Swiss passport would come in handy, when in fact it was cause for suspicion. He was taken for a spy and landed in the gulag. Actor Witold Zacharewicz died in Auschwitz, not long after playing Zygmunt August in Barbara Radziwiłówna. Henryk Szaro died in the Warsaw Ghetto. Leon Tristan died a tragic death on a ship bombarded in Odessa. Mieczysław Krawicz perished in the Warsaw Uprising. Ine Benita, the star of pre-war cinema, died in the sewer canals with a newborn child, etc., etc. A tragic series. And yet there were films being produced. Polish filmmakers took part in a number of productions. It certainly is an area worth discussing, especially since some of these films greatly influenced what would take place after the war especially in Poland, under communism, politically dependent. There were four distinct possibilities, four paths for Polish filmmakers during the Second World War. The first of these rendered work in cinema practically impossible, unless one chose to collaborate with the Nazis. This was to remain in the country. In September 1939, it became instantly clear that as Warsaw was being bombed, people, of course, stopped going to the movies. But there was the so-called Stanzinski crew, a group of filmmakers who approached the mayor of Warsaw, offering to film what was happening in the city. As such, the tragic scene of the burning royal castle in Warsaw was filmed by two crews. On the one hand, there were Mayor Stajinski's cinematographers, among them Jerzy Zarzycki, co-founder of Start, and Andrzej Ansuta, and on the other, American journalist Julian Bryan, who came to Warsaw at the time to make a film to simply show what was happening in the city. He filmed throughout the month of September, often risking his life. Then he smuggled the footage out of the city along with the last diplomatic transport. He later edited it into a film called Siege, which was released in 1940 and served as anti-propaganda against the Nazi propaganda films that showed an entirely different view of the war in Poland. The most shocking footage shows the faces of Warsaw residents. The events in Warsaw under siege from the moment of Nazi invasion were documented in this movie, which luckily still exists today. Once the general governorate was established, any regular filmmaking was out of the question. It carried the risk of severe consequences, including the death penalty, and no one took those chances. 
to groziło konsekwencjami, skalą śmierci włącznie, więc nie, nie pozwalano sobie na to. Some filmmakers, though by far fewer than, for instance, in France, which issued a few death sentences after the war for collaborating with the Nazis, but there were no distinct examples of collaboration. In fact, the underground movement promoted a slogan that translates to only pigs go to the cinema. Because firstly, it was obvious that any box office income would go towards funding the Nazi army. Secondly, an integral part of every screening was the Deutsche Wochenschau, or German newsreel, extreme propaganda that poisoned the minds. Hence, any patriotic cinema enthusiasts refused to go to the cinema, although regular screenings were, of course, taking place. At least, they wouldn't go to the cinema in Warsaw, where the underground movement was strongest. Krakow was another story. Longtime Filmoteca employee Jerzy Semilski, who lived in Krakow at the time, was diligent in making notes of every screening. Thanks to his efforts, the filmography of the Second World War period was recorded and saved, later published in the 1980s, and, as it turned out, the cinema repertoire in wartime Poland was quite impressive, consisting mostly of German cinema, as American films were completely forbidden. But it also featured a number of Polish films. Filmów polskich w tym repertuarze się znalazło. However, film production was absolutely out of the question. The only exception being a few Polish filmmakers, actors mostly, taking part in German productions. One famous example was the production of Heimkehr, a 1941 film directed by Gustav Uczycki, an extremely anti-Polish film. Actors who played in this film were later put on trial. Igo Sim, Austrian-born actor who cast this film, was sentenced to death and executed by the underground movement as part of their retaliation efforts. Many Polish artists, including Leon Schiller, ended up in Auschwitz. Yet the Polish Home Army featured a film department known as Rui, which in a way prepped filmmakers for life in the future liberated country. This department had its moment of glory during the Warsaw Uprising, where, to the extent that it was possible, they produced documentary footage, some of it staged. There were three editions of the Uprising newsreel, with a title that translates to Warsaw Fights. It screened at Cinema Palladium, for anyone interested in seeing it. As we know, this newsreel footage was recently remade and re-released theatrically, in color, with sound recorded, and presented in a narrative form. The filmmakers are the protagonists, we hear their voices. That marks chapter one, working in the occupied country, and the existing footage from the Warsaw Uprising. The second available path was cooperating with the Polish government in the West, first in Paris in the first year of war, where the first feature-length documentary, Jeszcze Polska nie zginęła, Poland has not yet perished, was being produced using footage filmed at the different fronts. However, it was never finished in France. 
France, as we know, had its own tragic days in June 1940. The government moved to London, and that's where the film was finished. July 1940 marked the first wartime screening, the premiere of this Polish documentary. This film office first operated in England, led by Eugeniusz Senkalski, one of the members of the pre-war START movement. Several more documentaries of the anti-propaganda type were made. One of them was White Eagle, narrated by acclaimed English actor Leslie Howard, known for his performance in Gone with the Wind. He was involved in the anti-Nazi campaign and soon died in an air crash. The film office later opened a branch in New York City, where Tsenkalski had moved. They produced a color film called Kraj Mojej Matki, My Mother's Land, by Romuald Gantkowski, a director who had made his debut before the war and who produced this film, a sort of film postcard, made with Eva Curie, daughter of the Nobel Prize winner, who narrated the film in English. Poland was Maria Skłodowska Curie's motherland. She was born in Warsaw at the time when an enslaved Poland was divided between three neighboring empires. This film portrayed Poland as a country that became an ally of the West, a country that needed help. The third road of filmmaking, the most prolific as it led to the largest number of films being produced, were the film units of the Polish armies operating in the West, especially the army of General Anders. His army's film unit, once the forces left the Soviet Union in early 1942, made the largest number of films. Mostly due to the fact that they had financial help and good equipment, but also because it was a group of excellent filmmakers, led by Michał Wasinski, who at first had been transported into the far realms of Russia, then luckily returned, and went on to produce a number of documentary films in the unique genre of war films. A type of wartime album, part essay, part documentary, part narrative and propaganda film. A whole series of such films was produced. The group also included a number of excellent cinematographers, Stanisław Lipinski, Severin Steinwurzel, as well as writer Konrad Tom, actors Kazimierz Krukowski and Jadwiga Andrzejewska. Their documentary about Monte Cassino served as a trademark piece of this film unit. Their efforts also brought the production of a film that, while produced after the war, must be mentioned here, as it was the direct result of the war effort. The only Polish narrative film made by these film units, a film called Wielka Droga, The Big Road. Wasinski made it to commemorate the work of Anders' army. The plot structure is that of a typical war film about a couple who is separated because of the war. But who come together happily in the finale. The film's narrative focused on a field hospital following the Battle of Monte Cassino. The main character, played by an amateur actor, in fact, most of the parts were played by amateur actors, loses his eyesight in the war, but not permanently, as it turns out. 
then gradually regains his vision thanks to humanitarian efforts, led by a nurse played by Jadwiga Andrzejewska, who would read his memoirs and remind him of wartime events. This was also an excuse for us to follow the story of Polish patriots. From just before the war in August 1939, in Lwów, all the way to Rome, with the happy couple's wedding after the war. It seemed that this great journey was meant to lead to freedom. But no more than several hundred people saw the film when it premiered, and its first public screening would not take place until 1990 on Polish television. The fourth path, which proved rather ineffective in terms of filmmaking, yet extremely effective politically, was the film unit of the Kościuszko Division, which was established as the pro-Soviet counterpart to the other armies after 1942. When Stalin broke relations with Poland's London-based government, he created a counterpart association of Polish patriots. And what was called Berling's Army, first colonel, then general. This army also featured a film unit, which naturally, and for obvious reasons, had in its ranks mostly Jewish-born filmmakers, who had fled to the Soviet Union from the Nazi threat. This included members of the START movement. The film unit was led by Alexander Ford. The leader of the cinematographers was Stanisław Wol, Start's top cinematographer. However, they had a difficult time cooperating with the Red Army. The Red Army did not trust them, provided little film stock. Only three segments of their reel were produced. The equivalent of what Antoni Bochjevich and his crew produced during the Warsaw Uprising. And of inferior quality, too. The first of these films was Idziem do Ciebie Ziemio, We're Coming to You, Our Land, an almost journalistic account from the oath of the Kościuszko division, when the army was being created. This gives us documentary footage of that event. They produced one other invaluable documentary, made before the end of the war, but after the city of Lublin was liberated in the summer of 1944. This documentary was Majdanek, Cmentarzysko Europy, Majdanek, the graveyard of Europe. Officially, it was directed by head of the film unit Alexander Ford, although Jerzy Bosak, who served as the ideological leader of the group, would later claim that Ford never so much as set foot in the Majdanek camp. Apparently, he was afraid. He did not want to see it. He knew his family had perished in Poland during the war, which is why he only gave his name to the film. It was likely, though, that he did take part in its editing. Ford and Bosak's crew went into the camp at Majdanek, a district of Lublin, immediately following the departure of the Nazis. This footage is shocking. The stories of the victims, the prisoners, are confronted with the stories told by the Nazi oppressors. Hitlerowskich 
This was the first such documentary film about a Nazi concentration camp, and as such, has special significance in the entire history of world cinema. At the end of 1944, the same film crew began publishing Polska Kronika Filmowa, or Polish Newsreel. This proved to be a lasting project. Despite its propaganda purposes, it lasted throughout the period of communist Poland and existed, almost to this day, in hiding, but most notably before 1989, when it would screen before every film. This newsreel had better and worse periods in its history, but it was generally well-liked by the audience and served as a propaganda counterbalance in communist Poland, often showing the incredible ingenuity and sense of humor of the filmmakers involved.